Let's talk about channels in convolutional neural networks. So far we looked at mostly grayscale images which had just a different level of intensity for you know, very bright to very dark images. For instance in Fashion MNIST we had values between 0 and 255 to indicate how bright the pixel was. But if we look at this picture of this woman here then it's very clear that grayscale isn't quite, a, quite going to do it justice. Just a small side note, it's a picture of a very famous woman called Lena. And it's actually taken from Playboy magazine from I think 1971 and 72. And mind you, this is the safe for work crop of that image. The reason why it got very popular among image processing uh, researchers is because the image has a lot of really interesting and challenging details in there. So there's a smooth skin, there's a lot of texture in the feather hanging off her hat, there's a lot of texture in her hat itself, there's a background blur, there are sharp edges, namely the contour between the hat and the background, there's some degree of bokeh hair and other things. So if you want to do really well in terms of image processing on that image, you have to invest a significant amount of work. This is why this is actually one of the more popular pictures. That's it. Let's look at the image in a bit more detail. So this is the same image but now split into red, green and blue. And you can see that there's different types of information in those three channels. If we were to treat the image just as grayscale, we would lose a lot of information. But if we have a convolutional neural network, well, we need to have a way how to deal with it. Turns out this is very simple. Recall what we did when we had a single channel input. Well, we just take our convolutional kernel, we applied it to that channel, and we got some output. Now, if we have two or three or more channels, it's very easy. We just apply a convolutional filter, most likely a different one, to every one of those channels. In the end, we just pad together the outputs, we add them up, and we have a final output. So. What happened here in this picture is we have two channels, we take two kernels, we apply them and we add it up and so we get this output and for instance in the upper left by convolving a 3x3 three three with a 2x2 two two kernel we get the number 56. Okay, So here's the math for it. I now have x which is now off ci times nh times nw dimensions, so input channels times height times weight. I have the same thing for the kernel, which now depends also on the input channels. And I get mh times mw output, so I still get you know only a two-dimensional output because everything's padded together. This is how you deal with multiple input channels. Of course, you could now ask, well, maybe a single input output channel isn't quite good enough. You might have multiple output channels for different features. And that's very easy. Well, you just take one convolutional filter for every output channel that I want to have, and then you stack up the results. So you don't add them together, you just stack them up. In this case, well, I have input channels, I have now a kernel that depends on output and input dimensions basic number of channels, and the dimensions, namely in terms of height and width, of the kernel itself applied. Okay, so that's what you get, and so you get input dimensions and you get output dimensions. Fairly straightforward. Now why would you, mind? Why would you want to have this? Well, because every output channel may actually recognize a different particular pattern. For instance, you might have horizontal filters, you might have vertical edge detectors, diagonal ones, filters that detect circular parts, filters that detect red or green or blue things, or maybe some combinations thereof. So that's why you need more than one. And of course, this is then fed as an input signal into the next layer where you can maybe do another fancy processing, but this is basically how you can organize a meaningful convolutional network. Now, there's one very special anomaly, namely one by one convolutional layers. So one by one layers 
Actually, it sounds kind of weird, right? What's a one by one convolution after all? Because I'm not convolving that pixel with anything else. It's just that pixel and it stays that pixel as we go through that pipeline. However, what happens is that it takes a linear combination of all the input channel weights and performs matrix vector multiplication, then followed by some nonlinearity, and then I get an output. In other words, this is a multi-layer perceptron which takes a certain set of input weights and generates the corresponding output weights. So this is therefore equivalent to a dense network applied pixel-wise. So to sum everything up, our two-dimensional convolutional layer summary, we have input channels, we have kernels that depend on inputs and outputs, and we have a bias, which of course depends now on input and output channels. And then we have some outputs, which are output channels times height times width. Okay. So why would this matter? Well, because if you actually then care about computing this efficiently, the cost now scales linearly with the number of input channels, because I need to process them, linearly with the number of output channels, because these are the ones that I need to generate, the kernel height and width, because that's the number of floating point operations that I perform, and then times the output height and output width. Okay, so let's put some numbers behind that. Suppose I have 100 input and 100 output channels. That's not unusual. Suppose I have a 5x5 five five convolution. That's also not so unusual. And let's say I have maybe 64x64 64 64 pixel images. So that all up, if you Work out the math gets you to about a gigaflop. Now one gigaflop doesn't sound like a lot, but if I have 10 layers of such a convolutional network, if I have maybe a million observations, that's 10 petaflops. So on a CPU that might perform at around 150 gigaflops, that takes 18 hours, whereas on a GPU that performs maybe at 12 teraflops, so that's a modern GPU for less than $500, you can get the same work done in 14 minutes. So now we have hours versus minutes, and that's one of the reasons why people nowadays use GPUs if they want to run convolutional networks and similar structures on large amounts of data.